Uh, if you will join me in our words of illumination this morning. Holy God, we know that our own words lack knowledge whenever we try to speak of you or to you. Yet we are drawn into your presence and desire to understand all your mysteries. So now, by the power of your Spirit, speak your words and we will listen carefully responding in awe and gratitude. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. I swear again I didn't collaborate with Joe ahead of time, but our first reading this morning is reminiscent of uh, some of our Sunday school lesson. This is from Job, chapter 38, beginning in verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, saying, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted with joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out of its womb, when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far shall you come and no farther, and hear your proud waves be stopped. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be God. God. gospel reading this morning comes from Mark chapter 4 beginning in verse 35. On that day when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in their boat just as he was, and other boats were with him. A great gale arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The word of God for the people of God. Praise Praise you, Lord Lord Jesus Christ. Have you considered my servant Job? That is the question that God asked the adversary in the first chapter of the book of Job. And that was the fateful question, the catalyst, the push that set in motion the chain of events that would leave Job in near complete and utter despair. You see, Job had seven sons and three daughters, and his livestock numbered in the hundreds. He was not only prosperous, he was good, or to use the more appropriate and specific biblical word, he was righteous. In defending himself before God, Job declared, I delivered the poor who cried and the orphan who had no helper. I caused the widow's heart to sing with joy. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. And really, we have no reason 
to believe that Job wasn't telling the truth. But disaster overcame this man of righteousness and prosperity. His livestock were killed by marauders and natural disaster. His children were all killed when a tornado struck the house in which they were having a party. And finally, Job is afflicted with a chronic, painful, and debilitating illness. However, Job still had his wife and friends, although he may have wished more than once that they too had been in the house with kids. Curse God and die, his wife urged. His friends were no better. They said things like, Who that was innocent ever perished? And happy is the one whom God reproves. Therefore, do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. In short, these friends insisted that Job was in the wrong and God was in the right. When Job couldn't take it any longer, he burst out and he declares, God has torn me in his wrath and hated me. He's gnashed his teeth at me. God gives me up to the ungodly and cast me into the hands of the wicked. I was at ease and he broke me in two. He seized me by the neck and dashed me to pieces. Though there is no violence in my hands and my prayer is pure. What kind of God is this? Job asks who allows the wicked to live and reach old age and grow mighty in power. How often is it that the lamp of the wicked is put out? Well, the story of Job, of course, is the human story. His misfortunes were more dramatic than the misfortunes that most of us are going to encounter, but they were different from ours only in degree, not in kind. Life is tragic. And to fail to appreciate the tragedy of human life is to fail to be fully human. But what makes Job most like us are his questions. Job's questions went on and on and on until he was worn out, until his friends were worn out, until God was just about worn out. To be human and to be thoughtful at all is to question much. And Job's questions are our questions. Why do the wicked prosper and the innocent suffer? Other questions, less momentous, but no less persistent, linger in the corner of our awareness, right? Does the one I love also love me? What can I do with my life that will bring me happiness and fulfillment? Will I have enough resources to live on in my old age. And above all, we wonder, why must I suffer and die? Why must those I love suffer and die? At times, these questions spin about us like a whirlwind. And Job's questions were like that too, until finally one day, someone spoke to Job from that whirlwind. Who is this? that darkens counsel by words without knowledge. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? You see, Job's questions got answered with more questions. In asking Job these questions, God seemed to be saying that there wasn't really an answer to his, or at least there was no answer that Job could understand. You see, the point of the book of Job appears to be that there are some questions to which there are no answers that the human mind can wrap itself around. And that can be terribly frustrating, right? Especially for those of us who like to believe that any question can be answered, any problem solved, if we just try hard enough and apply reason to it and study it and do our research. So is Job merely a rebuke of human reason to the quest to make sense of life and answer those unanswerable questions? Or does Job offer us some comfort in those sleepless nights when our mind just won't stop asking questions? The answer of Job is more, much more than the mere assertion that life's big questions are unanswerable. And that's because Job got more than just a rebuke. 
He got God. So do we. In the midst of the questions, in the midst of the whirlwind and the turmoil, there is God. And just as surely as God came to Job, God comes to each of us. Furthermore, this God who came to Job and comes to us is a God who hears our questions and speaks to us. God doesn't always answer our questions, for perhaps we don't even know enough to ask the right ones, much less to understand the answers. But this God who speaks in the midst of the whirlwind is a God who chooses to be in relationship with us. Consider the other biblical tale we heard this morning. Jesus and the disciples board a 15-foot fishing boat to cross from west to east along the Sea of Galilee. Should have been a short and rather uneventful journey, but instead we read that they encounter a fierce storm, and the comparison to human life is irresistible. Job, too, had every reason to think that his journey across life's sea would be uneventful, that he'd just grow old and die in prosperity with the comfort of his wife and his family around him. I mean, what more can any of us wish for? But storms arise. And like Job, the disciples ask, do you not care that we're perishing? It's a question that we're bound to ask time and time again on life's journey. Now, the Sea of Galilee, or more accurately, the Lake of Galilee in reality, is situated on an ancient trade route that linked Egypt with Syria and Mesopotamia. And there were towns founded by the Greeks and Romans and many others that flourished in the region. And there was a thriving fishing industry on the lake. And although the lake continues to provide an abundance of fish, Almost all those ancient towns have now been demolished. But in Jesus' time, people from all over the place would have passed through that area on their way to other parts of the known world. And so the Sea of Galilee figures prominently in the stories that Jesus hands down to us in the Gospels. By its shores, he recruited his first disciples. He gave the Sermon on the Mount. He fed the 5,000. He and his disciples crossed this water many times as they traveled through this region. And it was while on those waters the story we heard this morning took place. Now, 13 miles long and only 8 miles wide, the lake appears rather small to experience a storm as violent as the one Mark tells us about. However, there is a unique geography to that area. And it consists of a low-lying basin surrounded by hills. And that makes it prone to sudden and sometimes violent storms. And as local fishermen, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew were all intimately familiar with the unpredictable weather, including such storms and how you were supposed to handle it. And so the fact that they panic and wake Jesus up from what was probably a much-needed nap tells us that this particular storm was extraordinarily severe. The storm had pushed the disciples to their limit in spite of their knowledge of sailing and the Galilean weather, their boat sinking. And in desperation, they wake Jesus, not simply to warn him that his own life is in danger, but because they had nowhere else to turn. Don't you care that we're perishing isn't so much a question, as a desperate cry for help. They wanted to be out of the situation, which seemed hopeless, and so they did the only thing left for them to do. They call out to Jesus. And his response is not what they expected, or they wouldn't have reacted the way they did. They'd seen Jesus perform miracles of healing, casting out demons, and yet this act of control over the elements of the sea and sky utterly stuns them. In an instant, they're removed from the life-threatening situation and they're brought to a new place. Not just one of physical safety, but one of understanding, even if they can't yet fully comprehend the circumstances or the place itself. 
How often throughout the Gospels does Jesus do the unexpected? When faced with a hungry crowd and almost no food on hand, He sits the people down and feeds them. When He's teaching His followers who their neighbor is, the hero of His story is a despised Samaritan. When the disciples are faced with another dangerous storm on the same lake, Jesus walks to them on the water. To modern Christians, these stories passed down over generations have become part of the familiar fabric of our lives. And while we may question the specific mechanics of the miracles, or even the thinking of the observers, more often than not, we aren't startled by Jesus' actions and the way that the disciples and others in the stories are. Because no matter how cynical one may be, or how little one believes that miracles like those in the gospel can happen today, deep down, we expect Jesus to do something. How many times in life do we find ourselves in a storm beyond our ability to handle, when we reach our limits trying to deal with the situation, when we simply want out, and when we become desperate enough, we often find ourselves crying out to Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? You know, the early Christians adopted a simple drawing of a boat with a cross and a mass as the symbol of the church. And in an age of persecution from the outside and controversy and conflict on the inside, in their experience, the emerging church must have seemed like a boat tossed along a stormy sea. And recalling the story of Jesus calming the waves like the first disciples in the boat, the early Christians must have joined in their desperate prayer, Teacher, Do you not care that we are perishing? Little's changed over the intervening years. The winds of change and the waters of chaos continue to beat hard on the worldwide church and people of faith. Christians are still being martyred in shocking numbers and tribal, ethnic, and religious wars around the world. At home, the church is fiercely divided around issues of authority and liturgy and sexuality and cultural diversity. It got to the point in our former denomination that each successive annual conference would find me either arriving in Roanoke or Hampton with feelings of foreboding as I looked to the business before us with suspicious eyes, surrounded by people preparing to build alliances of power to bolster their respective sides. Today, the prayer of many in the church is, Teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? Our private lives aren't spared the stress and storm as our individual little boats are tossed by the waves of economic uncertainty and change and war and divorce and sickness and death. Hardly a week goes by we don't face the fearsome reality of these events, either impacting us personally or our neighbors or our friends or the church. And nightly, the troublesome images from television news and across the Internet intrude into our homes from the larger world. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? In today's Gospel, our Lord calms the winds and the waves and says to the tense disciples, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? He surely intended the link between faith and fear, because the opposite of faith is not doubt or unbelief. Those tend to be relegated to doctrinal differences. No, the opposite of faith more often than not is fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of the undiagnosed lump in the breast or the persistent cough. Fear of rising crime and rising grocery prices. Fear of losing control of our bodies and our health as we age. Fear of changes in politics and technology and the economy influencing our jobs and our income from our savings and retirement funds. Fear is like waves ever seeking to knock us off our footing. There was a Presbyterian minister who once told of his days as a Navy submariner in the Pacific Theater in World War II. 
And he said, we would often come upon, under depth charge attack by Japanese destroyers. And the other sailors would be trembling with fear while I would just lean back and read a comic book. And one of them asked me how I could stay so calm. He said, I explained to him that in my childhood I had very little supervision from my parents. So I spent many hours each day at the New Jersey beach. And sometimes a huge breaking wave would catch me by surprise and thrust me under the water, rolling me in the sand. But I learned... When I would just relax, thousands of air bubbles, like the fingers of God, would catch me up and lift me to the surface. And now, whenever I find myself in trouble, I just relax and wait for the fingers of God to reach under me and lift me up. Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? In these rather impatient words to his disciples, our Lord brings into focus the polarity of faith and fear. Faith is a stance, and how we stand up to things that would threaten us, and how we manage our fears makes all the difference. In the midst of troubles, we are called to reach our hands up to God and say, Help! We're called to reach our hands out to others and say, help! And then wait for the fingers of God that will never fail to reach down and lift us into new and reassuring experiences of His grace. Human life is lived under the sign of the question mark. And if that were the only sign over human life, we might well despair. The Christian faith, however, asserts there's another sign over human life. The sign of the cross. For we have not only the God who spoke out of a whirlwind and replied to Job's unanswerable questions with more unanswerable questions, we also have the God who spoke to the whirlwind on the Sea of Galilee and said, Peace! Be still. In the tempest of questions that fly about us, God comes to speak peace. And when we ask the question the disciples ask, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The answer is, he is the crucified and risen Lord who is with us in the storm and in the calm, on the sea and on the land, when we have all the answers and when we have nothing but questions. As with Job and the disciples, what the Lord offers us is relationship, his presence and his love, not answers in the middle of whatever we have to face. Like Job, we are caught, we've caught the ear of the one who laid the cornerstone of the earth. Like the disciples, we are never alone, no matter what happens to that boat or to us. A very powerful example of this comes from a scene in the movie Salma in which Martin Luther King Jr. visits Mr. Cager Lee, who is an 82-year-old man who is in the morgue identifying the body of his grandson, Jimmy Lee Jackson. Jimmy had been killed by a state trooper during a peaceful protest in Alabama. And Dr. King first says to him, there are no words. But then, like any preacher, he offers some words. <laughs> They're actually very good words. He says, I can tell you one thing for certain. God was the first to cry. God was the first to cry. What God offers Mr. Lee and what he offers us is presence and relationship. Maybe not in the form of a voice from a whirlwind or a handy miracle that instantaneously fixes things, but most often in a gentle reminder that we are not alone, that He is with us, 
and that He shares our pain. If we look for that, if we look for the loving presence of God Himself in the very heart of whatever is happening, we will find it. We won't always find answers or exemptions or solutions, but we will find this. It's not always what we want. It's not necessarily what we hope for. But it's there. And it's real. And it's enough. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.